It is a great honor and with great respect that I introduce Mr. Cooper Dunbar. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> The uh, widow of the guardian of the faith, Rhea Khanum, Amitabha Rhea Khanum, she used to say that the most difficult time that she ever has anywhere is with the chairman who creates such an image and dis describe you in such a way that you hardly know how to present yourself in front of the people. <laughs> Out of the kindness of their hearts and their generosity. I thank, thank you. No. <laughs> You didn't do as difficult a job as some people do. <laughs> Friends, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, mostly we're having a nice time going around talking with people about these glorious teachings. It's, it's something that uh, lifts our hearts. I think it may be clear to you we don't have any clergy. There's nobody arranging my trip. I get invitations from Baha'i communities and, and firesides and try to uh, uh, oblige by showing up. And I, get a, I think I get more out of it than the people get, probably that's for sure, because one has to think about what you're going to talk about and then forget about that and ask for the inspiration of the Divine Spirit, which operates in all the religions. And in the Baha'i teachings, it says quite clearly that the teachers of the... And, it, and because there's no clergy, suddenly all the Baha'is become... Um, messengers. They have to deliver the Baha'i message to other people. Uh, they don't do that unless they're, they've got a listener, but uh, they need to prepare themselves. The guardian of our faith said we need to spend our time studying and teaching. And those two processes stimulate each other. Because the more you, you talk, people ask questions, and you say, oh my goodness, I don't know how to answer that. And you go back into the ocean of the Baha'i teachings, and you come up with some answers, which hopefully you'll remember the next time around. <laughs> and you, you, know, you pray, oh God, help me to survive senior moments. <laughs> when the nouns all disappear. I don't know why proper names disappear first in, in the aging process. I, w I once heard an old German teacher, he said, I've lost my knowledge, but I think some wisdom has remained after all these years. Hand of the cause, Dr. Adelbert Muschlegel, in a winter school in Cyprus years ago. And I, th I fell for it. I mean, I, heard, I thought, well, poor old gentleman, he can't remember things anymore. And then he had a class he was offering on Christian prophecies. So he was... He stood up and he started writing from memory in ancient Greek the verses of the Bible and explain, <laughs> explaining them to the audience. I thought, well, you really lost your knowledge. I don't know what you had before this, but <laughs> it's pretty, pretty impressive what you've got now. Dear, dear old man, he just finished an encyclopedia. He rewrote the history of mankind in, I don't know, something like 10 volumes based on the Baha'i basic principle of progressive revelation that is uh, the reiteration of, of what dear Dorothy was telling us, that the Baha'i point of view from, drawn from the Baha'i writings, from the Baha'i revelation of these two great messengers of God in the 1800s, is that there is one God, invisible, undefinable, and he's the source and emanation of all existence throughout the universe. And he is the one that makes your heart beat and your breakfast digest and all the other things. That all power comes from him, no power comes from us, so to speak. So it's a basic, basic principle. And this uh, progressive revelation is the, is the backbone of the whole thing. So that's wonderful. Now, uh, what to supplement, uh, perhaps from what Dorothy has said, would be that the, in... Baha'u'llah says, when you do investigate the truth of the religions, when you look at the scriptures of the religions, the, I think you'll find that the, there are eternal teachings in the religions that are the same right across the board. For instance, they all teach that the, 
human reality, there is a soul which animates us. And what I liked, having, having I, did, I wasn't born a Baha'i and I read scriptures when I was a teenager from different religions, the Quran and the Buddhist teachings and so on. The idea is that the model or design for everything is really spiritual, it's not material. The emanations of the energies and creative powers of our creator act on matter and raise up in world upon worlds that are born and die, raise up mineral combinations, the, the, what we would call the mineral spirit or the mineral stage of existence. And then that graduates, it gradually works through long periods of evolution until it produces growth. And you have the vegetable kingdom. And then the animal kingdom comes, then the human kingdom. All of this, he says, our evolution is true, but it's not haphazard. God knows where it's going from the very beginning. So just like at the time that you're conceived, it's clear in the creative plan how you're going to evolve, what kind of appearance you're going to have, what kind of uh, uh, length of your life. Baha'u'llah says we have been given free will by God so that we can participate in creation. He could have made us all automatons, marionettes, puppets, you know, that he moves. The Bob says in one place that if he wished with one single word he could cause the submission of all humanity. Well, that, that, it, it, that doesn't allow for the human race to play the role of being human in which they have to make choices. Because the greatness of us, of human beings, is that we choose the will of God over self-will, over prideful self-love. This is a challenge. That's a major challenge. And the way God is, seems to have produced this, and somebody asked the beloved guardian, why did he do it that way? And he said, we don't know. It was his choice. <laughs> he is an active intelligence of a, of a level, of a, a type that we can't conceive of. And anything we can conceive of with our limited human capacity is the light that his emanations, his scriptures produce in our own soul, which he, he says he has endowed with capacity to recognize his grace, to recognize his mercy, to recognize his bounties. The human race, uh, uh, the way I understand it from the reading from the Baha'i writings, is uh, unable to progress without the influence of the manifestations of God. That actually, though we are un unaware of it, that the divine spirit is constantly acting through us, acting in us, sustaining us. It isn't a creation that's made and then God says, well, I'm tired and I'm going to rest. And then he looks back and he says, well, it didn't work out too well. Maybe I'll do another one or something. It isn't like that. It's, he is the constant creator. In fact, there are some of the, some of the uh, schools of divine teachings say that there is an instantaneous renewal of creation moment by moment. That it's so close together that it appears to us to be a continuum. I like that image because it makes God here right now. It makes the divine force right constant with us and Abdu Baha in a talk in Paris he says that even the power of thought is the result of the emanation of the divine forces through us otherwise we wouldn't have consciousness consciousness is very spiritual you know if these days because we live in a very materialistic orientation a society that's plagued by the poison of materialism not that the Baha'is don't favor material progress, but that's a whole half of the Baha'i message. But to center on that, to the denial of spirituality or of, a, of any kind of spiritual reality, to limit ourselves in our science and in our thinking to only those things that we can feel and touch and, and see, is to impoverish our, our vision and understanding of existence. All we need to do is ask ourselves a question like, can you define life? Can you show me life? What, what is life? Can you show me love? What color is it? You know, is it hot or cold? 
does kind of change character, doesn't it, sometimes? <laughs> Hate, what, is, what does it look like? There's so many spiritual qualities which dominate our life and the way we look at things that it's, it's, it's really very, a very difficult time in history that we have as a general starting point no, ex no existence of God. A lot of people, of course, everybody, many people believe in God, but the idea is that you don't teach that in school. Oh, no, no, not anything like that. And, you know, I feel also myself moving around talking to atheists sometimes, I feel that they have a point because they get the idea talking to the followers of religions. They're not soundly based in their spiritual teachings. That God maybe is an old man with a white beard and sitting on a throne somewhere in some planet or something like that. One of our Baha'i leaders was uh, born and raised in Russia and he was in the, in the communist period, he was in university in Moscow and he had a roommate. It was forbidden to believe in God. The roommate became suspicious that this Baha'i, who was very much a Baha'i, uh, was believing in God. And he said one day, he, he told me this story, he said one day he accused me, he said, you believe in God, don't you? And he said, I certainly don't believe in the God that you don't believe in. <laughs> Which is this, that was Mr. Furatan, who many, many of the Baha'is will have heard, heard of, and has written a number of Baha'i books, and very scholarly Baha'i. Anyway, he got through that period and ended up serving the faith in the Holy Land, in the center of the faith. So, the, the vision that the Baha'i teachings offer us of the reality of existence is a very broad one, and a very rich one. So it says we have a soul, we all have a soul. This, you, you have the human reality, which in the first stage, you have some mental education. You, you're trained, the situation that you're in in life causes you to have to start to discern different possibilities and opportunities in your, in your environment. You, anybody that's raised children knows how that looks, how you watch them gradually extend their understanding of the material realm. And also they get pretty quickly, they get to understand how, how to finagle their way with parents and with those that are training them. They're sharper than we are, so to speak. I think you can all ag agree with that. They need, uh, of course, they need spiritual training and education. But the first stage is a mental development. That goes on into teenage life and until somebody Perhaps they speak with someone or someone re speaks to them about the reality of religion. And if they can be attracted, if as human beings the soul can be attracted, that there's another stage of education besides material, physical education, besides mental education, because we see the mental education, it can give two outcomes. It can give an outcome that's very spiritual, but it also can give very evil outcomes in the I can invent some machine of war that destroys many more people than a, a shotgun could. So on top of this mental education, there needs to be an ethical, a spiritual orientation. And that's what, what uh, Baha'u'llah says has been the way of God, <coughs> eternal faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future, and he makes no claim to be the final messenger of God. He said within a thousand years, no other messenger will appear. But after that, a whole chain of continually, you'll have the, does the sun ever stop rising? But when it rises, because it calls itself Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, is it really a different sun? We know that that's not the case. There's one sun. So he says the reality of the divine spirit that shines through the great teachers of mankind who it's hard to confuse who they are because they last the thousands of years and they have millions of followers. It says also that religion generally needs renewal. 
Why does it need renewal? He said, because we mess with it. The human, human agencies add things to the original scriptures. And they also have taken definite steps uh, to include those elements which would make their faith exclusive and generally condemn the other religions. But that's not in the scriptures. In the scriptures, you look and you see the prophets of the past are confirming the ones that came before them and announcing more of them to come in the future. Every single revelation, so look at Christianity, has that, you know. It talks about the, the coming of the spirit of truth in the future that will guide you unto all truth. It talks about the, the return of the, in the name of the Father, the in the glory of the Father that a messenger should come to us. It talks about the paraclete. So all, there are elements there that need to be thought about and weighed carefully. And I think gradually through that, we come to understand that there's one system. We have one God and he has one system and he's gradually moving us along. Kind of like the children in the levels of different levels of school. And now it, it would immediately, I think, strike us as foolish if we said, you know, I'm, my favorite one is third grade. I've been repeating it over and over <laughs> for, because it's my favorite. I don't want to move on. I'm a little afraid of the fourth grade, you know, I don't know what they teach there. Okay, from a Baha'i point of view, all the teachers have been at the same college. That is, they're inspired with the same universal knowledge. But they're not able to deliver a message which is not relative to the time that they appear in. Christ is going to call us to a united mankind, let the globe be one, let the earth be one. The earth was flat when he spoke. It was still flat. Nobody knew about America, except the Americans. <laughs> the, early, <laughs> the early Americans. They had their own messengers. But you go uh, amongst the tribes in South America and so on. They've had s lesser guides and they've had greater guides. Viracocha was the great Incan um, prophet, prophet figure. And he taught the basic virtues is what he taught. And when the Christian missionaries go and speak to them and tell them that Christ walked on the on the water in the Sea of Galilee, they said, oh, he may be then. He may be right because our Viracocha walked on the Lake Titicaca. We have <laughs> traditions about that. So, so <clears throat> if we can recognize that they're all representatives of one God, that the message of God for the time we live in is, is the one that's relative to us, and is all-embracing. Fortunately for Baha'u'llah, he's come, he's given us an all-embracing message. And he calls on all mankind. He said, give up the differences, look for the unities, move together. Because in consultation and voluntary action on the part of mankind, we need to organize ourselves for the well-being of the whole planet. That's really what the basic Baha'i Baha message is. Provide an atmosphere in which we're, we can all be comfortable, we can all <clears throat> come to the threshold of our potential and pass into a spiritual understanding that prepares us for the next stage. Baha'i teachings say there's three <coughs> stages that we're aware of now. And undoubtedly, there's an infinite number of stages, but the first, and these have different degrees in them. One is the, is the child in the womb, where the, womb is, the child is busy preparing or is being equipped with the kind of equipment it needs in this world. Now, in this world, once born, it's got the necessary equipment for this world, whatever it is, and it needs to acquire the, what it needs for the next stage, after death. Baha'u'llah says, death is the messenger of joy to thee. Wherefore dost thou grieve? You enter into a much fuller existence. He does say, he says, if we were to reveal, if the prophets were to reveal the next world very clearly, we would all take our lives immediately. <laughs> Nobody would tolerate to live in this. Very difficult. Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, one of the center of his covenant and of his teachings for mankind, was faced with a lady in New York who said, what are the Baha'i teachings about reincarnation? She liked the idea of reincarnation. And Abdu'l-Baha'i said, Madam, he said, 
No merciful God would make a soul pass through this world twice. <laughs> Another lady was completely entranced with Fufu, her dog, and she said, will Fufu be with me in the next world? And Abdu'l-Bah so wisely, he said, if you need her, you will have her. <laughs> Brilliant. Now we have everything we'll need in the next world. Uh, Clearly, Abdu'l-Bahá says that everything that's here has existed first there. That's the source of art, culture, science, inspiration. Everything is coming through the next world. And he says the next world is right here. And the angelic souls are attached to each of us in a different way. Islam says very clearly, you have guardian angels. Baha'u'llah says there is an angel assigned, a heavenly soul assigned to every one of you who notes down everything you say and do. Oh my goodness. You know, I mean, there's some of us would like to have heard that a long time ago. Get started in the right direction here. Anyhow, uh, that's this, uh, uh, we hear now in near-death experiences, people talk about the life review that they encounter. Some have come back and they said, they see it all played, everything played in front of them. And one of the things that I, I noticed with interest in those reports is, is where he, he says that the soul feels the pain, all the pain it's caused to other souls in the course of the life review. And all the joys and upliftment that it's produced. So in the end, the soul is its own judge. God is not judging a in any case, God only judges us in terms of what we've been given, what we have done with what we've been given. And that is the basis of everybody's salvation, so to speak. Then your position in the next world in different degrees in which you receive further spiritual education. And he says there's an endless degrees after that. Eternal life. Why do you fear death when... This whole thing is ahead of us. Now, I know it's a, uh, you speak to people who've had near-death experiences, if you do that. I know my wife one, had one in the Holy Land. And, and she said, the amazing thing about it is that after that, you don't fear death at all. You know there's this m glorious thing ahead of you, and you don't have any fear. It's a terif terrific gift. You've had this very difficult, difficult test, she said, is to go there and have to come back. She reminds me that I told him on the other side, I, my husband's alone and I think I should go back and take care of him. <laughs> then she looks at me like, so shape up, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> so when we go to the next world, there's a whole lot. And there more because of progressive revelation, that means there's a greater outpouring on the different essential ter eternal teachings of God. There's a greater outpouring each time and so we have much more on life after death than we ever had before. One of the things that um, the Baha'i is being challenged with, the need to share the faith with other people. They asked Abdu'l-Baha, how, how can we do this better? You know, we, we, we love the faith. We want to say the right thing. We don't want to put obstacles in the way of the people. We want to attract them to the teachings to the point where they begin feeling the Baha'i Spirit, which is really the, the saving and inspirational element, the fellowship that it produces, the core for this oneness of mankind that's at the very heart, if you will, of the Baha'i teachings. Senior moment, friends. <laughs> I don't know quite where I was going with that. I get spinning off on lesser items then. Anyway, okay, so we're going to the next world, and we're learning about that, and he tells us that it's dependent on two things. There's two duties that are essential to the human reality while we're here. One is to recognize the messenger of God for our time, and the other is to embrace entirely his teachings and try to live them, try to act in accord with them. Now, God doesn't get anything out of us recognizing and obeying him. I mean, look at, if you think of this endless universe, and he affirms, he says, there's an endless universe. It's never had a beginning and never has an end. 
creational stories have to do with the creation of spiritual communities on earth. But we don't have to try to understand how the world was only 6,000 years old and, and why do we have things that are older than that and people telling us well, that God can do what he wants and he makes these old things to appear old so that you know you be tested and so on. We don't have to have that. We can have a scientific view of it if we understand scripture spiritually and if we're provided with the kind of interpretations. I think it's in second book of Peter in the Bible he says that scripture is not open to human interpretation. You really need another prophet to come along and tell you what it means. So out of prophecy, you know that something is coming, but you don't know all the details. Think from a point of view of the Baha'i teaching about science and religion must agree. Clouds are something that rise up. And we're told that Christ will come on a cloud, for example, and all eyes will see him. That's a very extraordinary physical challenge to try to understand. But Baha'u'llah in the Book of Certitude, he says, one of the great mysteries of, of the coming of the manifestations of God is that he comes in a human form and he suffers hot and cold and the different, different things that we suffer. And that this physical reality of his becomes a cloud for us. We say, but he's a man like me, how am I gonna follow him? And yet the power of revelation that comes from him when he dictates these verses of God and the upliftment that that produces is, is the greatest uh, proof after his own reality. If we had the eyes with which God has given us to see, he says you will see in the manifestation of God, you'll recognize immediately his greatness. And if you read the history of those people that have been in association with Baha'u'llah, you see the extraordinary veneration that they had for him and how he withstood being a prisoner and being exiled and being tortured, all the things that happened to him that should tell us, as he says in the opening pages of the Book of Certitude, that one of the great proofs of the manifestations of God's coming is that, that everyone arises to persecute him. And Abdu'l-Bahá says, no one throws rocks at trees with no fruit. It's a, it's a tendency to attack something new that challenges my relaxed, uh, traditional way of living. None of us like that, and yet we need to become flexible and open if we're going to move to a new stage. Baha'u'llah says, if all the Buddhists say, well, I'm a Buddhist and I'll, I have to be a Buddhist, and the Muslims say, well, I'm a Muslim and I'll always be a Muslim, I, and I'm a Catholic and I have to be a Catholic, so if everybody sits in that position, we cannot form the spiritual unification of mankind. That's why he invites us to look at the scriptures and the heart of this, and also invites us as the House of Justice does too, <laughs> to take a look at the Baha'is and see if they, have a, if they have a spirit which will contribute to this unification of mankind. And we're all trying to be mirrors of that and embody it. It's the surest and fastest way to be confirmed in the Baha'i teachings is to feel the spirit that flows from Baha'u'llah through those that are trying to, to live, his life, live the life that he calls upon us to do. And the effect that produces in gatherings like this gathering here tonight. Audubon says, in order to achieve the oneness of mankind, he calls on the Baha'is. He said, you must shine like the light of the sun. Your love for mankind must be like the light of the sun. Now, why does he say that? But the light of the sun is life-giving. Everything depends on the light, the light of the sun, okay? But also, it doesn't look to see if it's shining on the house of a saint or of a sinner or of a, a criminal. It shines everywhere the same way. And Abdu'l-Bahá says, this is the secret of, of right living, is to not concentrate on the negative in other people. You can find in anybody faults. Because, he says, this is not a world of perfection. You don't reach perfection. You move towards perfection. Your intention should be to perfect and take on spiritual qualities, but th th that's something that's, it's something in process. 
So the Baha'is in their association with each other have to be very forgiving. And we all have to know that we're at different stages in our growth. And shine with this light of the sun, like the sun, which is the light, of course, of the love of God that we have. We love God, so as a result of that, we love his creatures. Abdul Baha, when uh, there was an American woman with her daughters, Corinne True, was visiting in 1909 in the Holy Land on a pilgrimage and met with Abdul Baha a number of times. Before Abdul Baha sent them away at the end of their pilgrimage, he said, I want to give you a, an example. He said, I want you to look upon every soul that you meet as a letter from your beloved. If you're in love and you get a love note from your lover, you're very keen to know what it has to say. And never mind, he said, that the envelope may be stained or ripped or dirty. Look inside, look deep inside for the message of the beloved. And each of us is endowed with the capacity to reflect a facet of our creator that no one else ever has reflected or ever will reflect. And to the degree we do not develop our spiritual capacity, we deprive mankind and the spiritual history of the world of that blessing. Difficult for us to see that perhaps at the stage we are, we are supposed to look at our shortcomings and not look at the shortcomings of others. But at the same time, there is this promise. And sometimes when you're speaking to people and you say that you have treasures within you that haven't been awakened yet, or they have been awakened, and they should be developed, they should be cultivated. This marvelous uh, possibility, people say, you know, you see something in me, I don't, I don't see in myself. And I think the Baha'is are trying to do that. At least we should be trying to do it. And we invite anyone who feels attracted to that action to join in and to help us with realize this unity of mankind and be able to eliminate the terrible prejudices and hatreds which exist between races and religions and political parties and nationalities, all kinds of things that have been invented by people but not by our creator. Where are the lines that God put on the face of the earth to make us different countries, Abdu'l Baha asks. We can't find them. So this is the, really the essence of this, is the awakening of the human soul. Um, two pillars, he said, exist in all the religions for the development of spirituality. One is prayer and one is fasting. In the Baha'i faith, the prayers that are most particularly related to that function are called obligatory prayers. And Paola offers three versions of different lengths that you can choose one of for your daily prayer. The longest one is what, 10 or 11 minutes, it's not very long to recite. But it renews our pledge to God. It renews the affirmation of the oneness and power of God, the central consciousness that we should develop and acquire. Now since we can't know the wholeness of God, the mind of God, if you will, the intelligence of God, the holy books tell us that the world is filled with signs of God. And you have to learn to read the signs. In Arabic this is ayat, that's the, they are the signs of the cosmos. They're all the different things we can see. There, the fact that you have blood in your finger, that the fact that the rose has a perfume, the fact that an act of kindness and compassion fills our soul with appreciation. The fact that the infinite universe, we're seeing now more and more images of it, it just goes on forever. And Baha'u'llah is the first manifestation that's really talked about other planets. He makes a statement, he says, every fixed star in the universe has planets and every planet has creatures whose number no man can compute. Why would God fill up the whole universe 
I remember when I was a kid in school, they told us, no planet, no planets exist anywhere except planet of this Earth. Earth. This uh, sun we have is the only one with planets. So it's a fluke. And then the bigger fluke is that we got these intelligent human beings running around with rational powers to hurt each other. What is that? You know, not a very interesting picture of the universe. But uh, religion goes out. Okay, we can't say we have the scientific proofs of that. But we certainly see from the time I was in high school and they were teaching that until now where we see the vastness of the universe and every, every few months they say we found the new limits of the universe. And then they say we found a further limit of the universe. It's just, it's so amazing just the existence of creation, existence of the vastness of everything is enough to, I think, um, engender in us an attitude of hum humility towards creation and towards the creator that sustains all this. Now it's a challenge. A messenger who is a human being says, God has raised me up and he has called upon me to deliver a message to you. And here's the message. First of things, oh kings and rulers of mankind, Baha'u'llah addresses them with the, right at the top, you know, because they contained, controlled, and had most of the power over mankind. There weren't constitutions, there weren't systems of law to protect citizens. You were dependent on the will of the, of the sovereigns that you lived under. And there's no joke, the off with your head. I mean, they did, there's no, uh, it was just part of, part of life. The, sh the Shah of Iran, the, kind of the powers that he had, when the Bab, this young herald of the Baha'i faith, herald of Baha'u'llah that arose and announced the coming of one greater than himself, wasn't, he came from a class of merchants. And in Islamic society, that would have been forbidden for you to say, to say anything about religious law or religious prophecy or anything with religious content. That was for the clergy, reserved for them. It's like I remember with the Catholics in Nicaragua, they said, no, no, don't read the Bible. Only the, only the priests can read the Bible. They're the only ones capable of understanding. You'll just confuse your faith if you read the Bible. It's not a very evangelist pro approach to it, but it was there. And then sud suddenly they allowed, after the conclaves and things that they had, they allowed the, uh, the reading of the scriptures. And they read it in Spanish in the church. And they read the mass in Spanish. That really upset people because they were so used to the traditional way. They didn't want to hear the, the, the common words that they could understand. It, there was a certain mystery to having it in Latin. Mm -hmm. Those curious, curious stages were, were moving through. There's also a terrific divisions amongst the religions. If we could say that, you know, if there was one center of each of the faiths to invite to into interfaith activities and so on but there's so many diversified groups and sects in sex in the uh, the different faiths you know Islam itself has I don't know 72 of them I think talk about it it's the Christian sects now last count I heard was something like 6,000 and each one says we're the way and the truth it's, it, it's, you get a kind of a, a realization that instead of holiness, you have a certain commercial <laughs> dimension to it, which I, is not the intention to criticize the other face. We want to bring them up to a greater vision. But uh, the situation is very desperate, and people have moved away from religion, and religion has kind of become a bad word in many quarters. People don't want to talk about religion. You mustn't talk about religion because it always produces some kind of difference. Whereas the whole idea of religion is religar, is to relink, is to bind together human souls. And so Baha'u'llah gives us a new vision of the role of religion and trans that transcends all these minor differences and things and brings us to look at the central teachings of that God has given us. This seems to be the, as far as I understand, the, the purpose of the Baha'i faith.
Now I brought with me tonight a brief sketch of the history, aims, and significance of the Baha'i Faith. This is a document Shoghi Effendi penned for the special UN Commission on Palestine at the time of the partition. The, the government, uh, the, this committee, asked the different religions and religious heads in, is, in what was to become Israel, what is their role in the country and what is the... What is their aim? What is their purpose? And Shoghi Effendi penned this terrific resume of the Baha'i teachings. We don't have time to get into it tonight, but I wanted you to know about it. And perhaps someone will draw it off one of the websites. It used to be in the introduction to World Order Letters and <clears throat> some of the Baha'i books. I also wanted to recommend that to the Baha'is who are engaged in thinking, how can I share this teaching with others, to look at it, because it's a balanced picture of all of the Baha'i teachings. Uh, let me just quote a few lines from it to, to end. How are we doing with time? Are we You're doing just fine. I'm doing just fine. I'm using it up or <laughs> properly. <laughs> no, but at 9 o'clock, it's generally... But would you hear... We will go as long as you feel like right. So I guess I was feeling the time. But I'll share, share if I may, a few, few lines of this Please, with you. And of course, you will be back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I had to say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope so. It took a long time to get here. And <laughs> I'll try to, now that I know the road, I'll try to get here more often. So some of the things he says... First, he, he says that the faith established by Baha'u'llah was born in Iran, and then he goes on to explain through a series of exiles, Baha'u'llah was sent by the Turks uh, to Akka, which is a city now in northern Israel, and is the location of the resting place of Baha'u'llah, and the, the most holy center for the Baha'is in terms of where they direct their prayers and where they go on pilgrimage and so on. So because he, he wanted to uh, establish, locate why the Baha'is are in Israel, in Palestine, which became Israel at that time. Then he wants to describe, well, what is the Baha'i faith? Look how he goes about it. He says, alike in the claims unequivocally asserted by its author and the general character of the growth of the Baha'i community in every continent of the globe, it can be regarded in no other light than a world religion. By the very nature of how Baha'u'llah defines it on the one hand, and by the fact that it's spread to 183 countries around the world that have national Baha'i communities. So it, it, it presses upon the listener, the reader, that it really does constitute a world religion. And it's considered the, the fourth of the great religions in the Holy Land. You know, you've got... Judaism and Christianity and Islam and Baha'i. And the Baha'i Center now is a very important, uh, established on the slopes of Mount Carmel, and this is also according to prophecies, biblical prophecies of the past. It attracts uh, the majority of the tourists that go to Israel, visit, visit, the, holy, visit the holy place. Then he, said, he describes, well, what is this religion? What kind of a world religion is it? And he says it's destined to evolve in the course of time into a world embracing commonwealth whose advent must signalize the golden age of mankind in which the unity of the human race will have been unassailably established, its maturity attained, its glorious destiny unfolded through the birth and efflorescence of a world-encompassing civilization. Pretty tall order, as you can imagine. And all of the pieces and parts to motivate and inspire the development of a world commonwealth, a common civilization, a divine civilization, he says, for the first time, because the seed of it comes from revelation. This is the promise of the holy books of the past, the promise of the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a terrific vision. 
He goes on to say, those sprung from Shia Islam. Now, if Shia and Sunni Islam, in the past, we didn't know very much about them, but through the conflicts in the Middle East and all the rivalries and things, we've come to know something about it. I know when I was a new Baha'i, I didn't know, I mean, I knew Islam, but I didn't know anything about Shia and Sunni. It sprung from Shia Islam and was regarded in the early stages of its development by the followers of both the Muslim and Christian faiths as an obscure sect, an Asiatic cult, or an offshoot of the Mohammedan religion. Now you can imagine Shoghi Effendi would, if he didn't go just very openly about that, some of the members of the commission would say, well, that's a sect, or it's this, or it's that. But he wants to defeat that point of view. This faith is now increasingly demonstrating its right to be recognized not as one more religious system superimposed on the conflicting creeds which for so many generations have divided mankind and darkened its fortunes, but rather as a restatement of the eternal verities underlying all the religions of the past and as a unifying force, instilling into the adherence of these religions a new spiritual vigor, infusing them with a new hope and love for mankind, firing them with a new vision of fundamental unity, the fundamental unity of their religious doctrines, and unfolding to their eyes the glorious destiny that awaits the human race. What is the Baha'i faith is a great message of love and hope basically, uh, the simplest definition maybe you could give. Then he elaborates in one sentence, which happens to be a whole paragraph, progressive revelation. This is Shoghi Effendi, is a master of the English language. How he got to be that, one wonders, you know, this is amazing. He studied at Oxford for a time, but it wasn't his native tongue, and he's be written so beautifully. The, this, let me share this with you. The fundamental principle enunciated by Baha'u'llah, the followers of his faith firmly believe, is, and now this breaks down into nine aspects. You can count them and follow them here. The first one is that religious truth is not absolute but relative. That the teachings of God for the time we live in are not the same as identical as the teaching, particularly the social teaching, not the same as what was needed in a previous religious dispensation. Look at the laws of Moses. Some of them are very severe. Talk back to your father, you have capital punishment. You're, you must be killed if you counter your father. That's in the Bible. Harsh. You steal a piece of bread to cut your hand off. So th these are harsh things, but they were effective. I'm sure at the time I can only imagine how that <laughs> kept society in order for at least for a time. Not all broke down. Baha'u'llah questions the, the, the uh, Jewish priests at one stage. He says, uh, what is the law for adultery? What's the punishment for adultery? And they said, well, death. It's death. And he said, but, but they said we don't we don't impose the law for adultery because there wouldn't be anybody left. <laughs> so in a certain degeneration of the religion goes along. All right. So it's relative, but not absolute. So this is why Baha'u'llah talks about the earth as one country, he refers to the globe of the world. This is an, uh, was an, an understood reality now. We knew about both sides and up and down and all around. And then he says that divine revelation is a continuous and progressive process. God has one plan. It's not really separate religions that we have to decide how we're going to get along with each other. That's not the point. That their basic principles are in complete harmony. Independent investigation of truth again. That their aims and purposes are one and the same. That their teachings are but facets of one truth that their functions are complementary, that they differ only in the non-essential aspects of their doctrines, and that their missions represent successive stages in the spiritual evolution of human society, which 
in some of the other writings is identical with the social evolution of human society. That is moving through tribal unity and then um, <clears throat> first family unity and then tribal unity and then city states were established and then nations, independent nations came into being. And now Baha'u'llah says the last of these stages, the coming of age of the social evolution of mankind as, a, as if we were a single creature growing in the world, and have passed through childhood and adolescence and now we're about at the threshold of adulthood is international unity, world unity, world peace. So that's the crown of the whole process. And the ultimate stage of development for our, pla for our planet, which is going to take us a while probably to realize. We go through fits and starts and stops and we have some rehearsals of international government and activities and organizations. We're preparing people to be able to take part in it, I think, but it hasn't happened yet. And usually it happens only through fire. The United Nations was formed after this horrendous Second World War. The League of Nations after the First World War also wasn't satisfied, wasn't complete. And the United Nations was born and it, it's there as a system and you all, all realize it doesn't have any teeth. It has a veto power and individual nations really, any single one of them can <coughs> stop <coughs> things that are very important to happen. So that's the overview of the principle, basic principle by faith about progressive revelation. Tease, these are teasers, so to speak. Now we stop there, I think. I feel completely teased. <laughs> <laughs> That's given. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, coming and speaking. Uh, I'm not extremely familiar with the Baha'i faith, but I know a little bit. I actually had two... My two college roommates were Baha'i, and they were Iranian, so yeah, I learned from them. Um, but one of my questions was, um, what the take from like the Baha'i faith is on like the law of attraction and like the universe part of, part of it, you've talked about that a little bit, and just how like your thoughts are very important to your faith, and so how like you speak things into existence, uh, that plays a part, how heavily does that play a part? part in the religion or what is the connection? Uh, I, th I think that uh, maybe an easy way to say that is... Yeah. Is uh, that the, the two answer here is prayer and meditation. That is the verses, the divinely revealed verses, not human commentary on the meaning of religion, but the actual re part revealed by the manifestation. Baha'u'llah calls on us, for instance, in the kitab i Gon, which is the book of certitude. He says, <coughs> every few paragraphs he says, ponder, consider, meditate, reflect. All these things that, it's this mental power that works and draws the juice, so to speak, out of the divine verses. Out of the, like, it would be, I think in Islam is the same thing, meditate on the verses of the Quran. They have a power, uh, an energy, which, which if, if we could say that, the, the verses are crystallized divinity, crystallized energy of, of, the, of the power and energy flowing from God. It, it becomes fixed in these verses, which first become fixed as physical sound, because they're chanted by the revealer. And then they're written down with little black markings on a page. So they've gone from being sp deeply spiritual, the mind and the radiation of, uh, of the energies from the manifestation of God, to becoming markings on a page and then they get copied and printed and distributed and some of you have them in your hands. Now, our job is to reactivate them. It's as, it's as if they're, they're, they have this uh, they are the way and the life to get to the manifestation of God, to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit. So Baha'u'llah says, you know, the manifestation is the source of that inspiration and in 
his lifetime, you would want to approach him and see him and visit him. But after his passing, that same power is impregnated in these divine verses, in the books that, of Revelation that are left until the next manifestation of God appears in no less than a thousand years. He said there'll be more to come. So that's what awakens in us, I think, all these thoughts of ins the inspirations that you're talking about. And you want to, in the kind of inspiration that a Baha'i gets thinking about the verses, <clears throat> that gets enhanced, modified, uh, changed, the more he reads. The more a person, the soul reads, the verses are the source of the meaning of the verses. So multiple interaction with the verses of God is the thing that expands your, the solid spiritual consciousness that we're supposed to have, that awareness. Thank you. Did that answer? Yes. All right. Sir. Oh, thanks. You said, um, Anthony, please stand. I'm sorry. You said that we have personal angels assigned to us? <laughs> That's what I said, but I don't know anything about it. I read it in a, in a book. <laughs> I, I, believe my angel is, is, I believe my angel is sleeping. Well, I, <laughs> so I just wonder, can I get another angel assigned to me? <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I could elaborate on that. I hope mine is sleeping some of the time, too. Because either that or I, I, I would like to see if there's a tablet on divine erasures. <laughs> Yes, sir. In Israel, how many years were you there, sir? 20 years, something? 37 years. 37 years. Oh, wow. How were you accepted by the Hasidim, the Baha'i? Because my family lives in Jerusalem. Yeah. And they, I, they love the Baha'i Baha there. But how did the Hasidim in Mir Sharim and other areas, how did they accept us? Well, I didn't have a whole lot of interaction with them. The, the, those groups stick very much to themselves, but we had lots of Israeli friends, Jewish friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But nothing uh, with, the, with the Orthodox Jews? I, th I think the, uh, the Office of Israel Affairs at the World Center, there were uh, representatives from different nations that were there that had contact with them. As a, in the House of Justice, I d we didn't directly have any contact. Because I know when I met the Dalai Lama, you helped the Dalai Lama uh, with China, and I want him to come here, but they're, 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 I don't think we'll have enough room here. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah. And he would love to come. No, he came and visited and visited yeah, the Shrine of the Bob and, yeah, several times. Right. Okay. Please. For those who don't know who the Hasidim is, can you tell us what that was so that the question can be put into context? And well, it's a, it's the ultra orthodox, ultra orthodox Jews, Jewish. Really. Yeah. They don't even accept Israel. Right. They don't want Israel to exist what? because they believe in diaspora. That means Jews yes. should be all over yes. the world, not in one place. And I know there's I that, but there's <laughs> there's also the challenge that they say that Israel can only come into existence after the promised one comes. Right, right, right. So how can this possibly be Israel? Right. Not recognizing yeah. Baha'u'llah as the fulfillment of that prophecy. They're talking. They're yeah. Well, the world goes round and round and people <laughs> experience all kinds of things in their lives that God sends them to wake them up. You know, he tells us that he sends tests. Tests have been created by God, Baha'u'llah tells us, to awaken us to our potential, to our possibilities. And he says also, he said, no soul is ever tested beyond its limits. And you know, some of us feel like that's what we've had it to the limit, you know, but it, it happens from time to time. But that's the nature of it. And then it, you realize afterwards that the trials and difficulties that you have have enhanced your vision and your understanding and part of the spiritual process, you know, if you... Please. I, I don't, this is kind of esoteric, but, I'm sorry, sure. <coughs> I read a lot of Baha'i prayers, and the word <coughs> names, or thy name, or I think the most great name, or I just wonder about the word, sometimes it's at the ocean of thy names, submerged in the ocean of thy names. 
Tell me about this word names in the Baha'i faith. I want to know My, more my understanding that this is like names and attributes are very closely attached, you know? And the names are suggested qualities of God. Uh, so you see at the end of the prayers, the all-sufficing, the ever-forgiving, the most generous, these are the names of, called the names of God. They're the attributes of God, which we try to reflect as human beings. Now, Abdu'l Baha says those attributes <coughs> are our understanding of what God should be, not what God is. In fact, God is not any of that. He transcends all the possibilities we could have because we think of him in terms of being merciful to each other and being just to each other and being kind or if we see people who are wise. But the, the, in my understanding of the name, so many of the prayers say, I beseech thee by thy name, through which the world hath been called into being, for example, that's one, one phrase of that. Or th thy name uh, that is the all-conquering source of thy power. Thy name here refers to Baha'u'llah. It just refers over and over. But he's, there's a certain modesty in the manifestation, which is also, I mean, he's kingly and he commands the whole of creation. But in the prayers, he's, he steps back and uses this figure, thy name. And then some of the prayers you say, well, how do you know that, you know? But in some of the prayers, he says, I beseech thee by he who is thy name which is the key, I think, to understanding this question of the unidentified names. And the central name now, of course, is Baha. And the, the name, uh, he says, Baha al-Abha, Abha being the superlative of Baha, the glory of the most glorious, which is the, what uh, Baha'u'llah says is the most great name of God, the one name that wasn't given in the past. The last of the great names of God is this name of Baha. As this, it was a secret and it came out. The uh, point of view of the Baha'is anyway. Please. So, if you're the type of person on this plane who feels what they did wrong, and almost immediately when they do it, they feel how much they've hurt the individual. They suffer a lot. I know I do. Do I have to go through it again? <laughs> no, I, don't, I can tell you that because I don't know what you've done and I don't know how, how much you've suffered. But I think that we can trust that the mercy of God is the only hope any of us have. And I haven't seen any prayer for the dead. You know, the Baha'is have beautiful prayers for the departed. For, for men, for women, for couples, for <coughs> children that have passed, so on. All of these ask God to shower his mercy on the souls, to forgive, and because we, had, we don't come to complete perfection here, but the point is that we should be directing ourselves and intending to do good. That is very important is the motive that animates us in, in what we do. And that, 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 that has a, a curative effect. I just want you to know, I haven't done anything really, like, really bad. <laughs> Nobody's judging. Nobody's judging. Are you sure? Of course. But, but Baola warns us, he said, do not confess your shortcomings to other human beings. Mm -hmm. This is not in accordance with the love and will of God. Okay, confess them to your maker. <laughs> Confess them to God, you know, say, I, this, I made some mistakes and I want to get over it. I just want to know if I had to go through it again. Oh, you mean like a test? A test? No, no, what you were saying earlier. Was like I said, in the next world, you get to the next world, you're going to have a review of... A review. Yeah, I don't know how that, I don't know all the details of that. It's just suggested that it's there. And Maybe it was a foolish question. No, no. Not, no not too bad. But I, th I think so much is repaired by the fact that a person becomes a believer and really sincerely hopes to improve. That, 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 that makes everything flow the right way. But also, if you're taking yourself into account each day, you would know what you've done. Yes. Yeah, and you try to re make and the repairs to necessary. The next time. Yeah. But if you're totally unaware of 
the Baha'i principle is if you fall down, get up. Yes. You know, don't let anything paralyze you. Because there's a certain amount of pride in these bad mistakes, you know, that we say, I can't forgive myself. If I were God, I wouldn't forgive myself. Nonsense. It's nonsense. He's the ever forgiving, the all forgiving, the most forgiving. These are titles that are in all the prayers. It means that it's pretty hard for you to come up with to do something that he's not going to be able to forgive. But it's very important that the soul recognize the shortcomings and repent of it and ask for strength to do better. Mm -hmm. And then Baala Abdullah explains to Dr. <coughs> Dr. Getzinger in one interview that he had, he said, then God sends the test again. And then you fall on your face again. <laughs> and then he sends the test again and you fall down again. Until you get up, you, you implore his mercy. I've made the resolution to stop this and to do, not do this, mm -hmm. but I can't. And I'm now hopeless that I can't solve this. Mm -hmm. Which is the switch point where it says, can you solve it? Mm -hmm. And we turn to him and we trust that he can take care of it. And then Abdu Ba says the test comes again, it's not a test. But there's another one right behind it <laughs> because that's the way we progress. But uh, if you get desperate about something you don't seem to be able to fix, don't paralyze yourself on that. Shoghi Fendi says, as we're all called to teach the faith. He said, if you look at your own shortcomings, you'll be paralyzed. You won't be able to mention the faith to anybody. You have to put your trust in his promises. And his promises, it says, whosoever arises. Now, he does say you should try to teach yourself first and act in a good way. Try to live the Baha'i life, of which are all these qualities that we need. But we're all on, a, on the road. You know, making attempts, falling down, getting up, all like that. So just, please, yeah. They, uh, let her come and then, then we'll go to you next, okay? Yeah. Please. Oh, me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. In most religious writings, yes. since the objective is to attract more members, in most cases, there is, a, there is this thing about doing as God would want you to do and don't do as the devil would want you to do. Yes. Now, God is an unknowable essence. Yes. So, keeping that in mind, people are quoting what God thinks, what God is, wants us to do, and there's no way of knowing what God is, is wanting us to do unless there is a proven manifestation of God, like in Christian religion, they say it's Jesus. Yeah. Okay? But as we can see as we get further on into this thing, that all of these things can be questioned and they weren't witnessed by anybody. Yeah. So my question to you is, how do you tell someone based on, how do you tell someone that God is, how, how do you tell someone that God said something when that person is asking you something to uh, get salvation for his family, his life completely, and, and not misrepresent what you're saying to the individual. I, hope I'm, I don't know if I'm making sense or not. I can't hear myself. Um, so in other words, if you go into a court of law and you are going to say what John said, and John is not present and there's no evidence of what John said, it's hearsay and the court doesn't, it doesn't accept that. Okay, so we, if it's not acceptable for us to do this to a mere man, how much more horrible is that is to quote and say what God is saying when you can't really see? I'm, I'm asking you this question because somebody asked me this the other day, so I'm going to learn what to do here. <laughs> well, I hope I can answer it. I can just tell you that you want to have the revealed will of God. And that, that's what is, is in the certified verses that have been revealed. Now, in the case of Baha'u'llah and the Bab, we have a terrific leap from the past. More primitively, the Quran was a book that was committed to memory in the time of Muhammad, and there were a number of, <coughs> of disciples and things that had it by memory. And they all recited it together, and they went over the variations and fixed a, a permanent Quran, but after the time of Muhammad. Whereas in the case of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, 
they either signed or sealed their written documents. And they said only what is written and signed or sealed is valid scripture. And the will of God is manifest there in, in the case of Bob, five million words. In the case of Baha'u'llah, six million words we have in computers already. It's a terrific search and study any subject that you bring up. You, know. you want to know the nature of justice. How many quotations you'll, passages you'll find. But they'll be in Arabic and Persian, so you have to wait patiently <laughs> to get some translations. But the main things have been put in the gleanings. And there's another thing is that the, the verses are holographic in the sense that if you get into one of them, you have access to the meaning of all the others. It, it, they interact with each other. The verses reveal the meaning of verses. It, it compounds itself and you wouldn't ask what the will of God is. You've got enough on your plate of what he says it is that you need to take care of. <laughs> then why go looking for more trouble, you know, or more, or more revelation in that sense. So it, <coughs> it's important though to, to realize that we, we're not going to fall into errors of the past where the oral traditions became mandatory on the people. Like, you know, the Sharia in Islam, there's so many of it, contradictive hadiths. You try to look at the Isnad, at the whole progression of how they were recorded and hope they're faithful. Paula says any of the hadiths that the Bab quotes or he himself quotes are authentic. That authenticates them because they have been incorporated in their own documents. So that adds uh, a realm, if you will, of the affirmation of certain oral traditions in Islam, which before the Baha'i Faith was the only completely authentic repository of the Word of God, according to the, to the Baha'i writings, is the Quran. We know that it's Baha'u'llah and the Bab affirm it is the word of God, it's true. Now, the Bible has many divine verses, but it also has a lot of commentary by, uh, by the apostles or by others, which are inspired, we consider them divinely inspired, but that doesn't have the same um, intensity of authenticity that the, the, the ones that have gotten written down are, and are accepted. Yes, please, you have it. Thank you. Talking, going back to test and difficulty, um, I learned in the Baha'i faith um, how important it is to recognize them, to accept them, and at the same time to, um, to understand what is the purpose. And I learned when I was little, my brother uh, got paralyzed. And many of our families, they were really a pity of my family because of my brother being paralyzed. And they would say, oh, poor child, he will be better dead than in that condition. And um, they, my, my parents got really upset about that, you know, because nobody wants to be told that. And um, I was raised in the Catholic uh, religion. And I, one time I asked a nun, and I said, if God is so, so good and so kind and so wonderful, why did he allow us to have my brother having that accident and become paralyzed? And he was a baby when that happened. And um, the nun told me, you know, God in his infinite mercy, he sacrificed one of his angels and sent it to your home just as a blessing to your family. Fair so enough. what happened is I realized that he was really an angel. Because you will look at him and his eyes were clear and pure. He never complained. He was the light of the house. Everybody loved him. All the family was united. Everybody would change him, would bathe him, would feed him with love and smiling. He would just give you a smile to you. So I learned that. But I didn't really understand the concept of that test until I became a Baha'i. Because in the Baha'i faith, they teach us that the tests and difficulties in our life are to make us stronger spiritually. Yeah. So we can recognize, appreciate, and be thankful for the opportunity of learn and, and to grow. Yes. So uh, it's very interesting what you mentioned about test and difficulty. <coughs> how, how, huh? 
Tell me how long he yeah, lived. Yeah, the doctor said that he won't live more than 12 years old, and he lived until he was 30. Mm -hmm. And all those 30 years was just pure blessings for us. Mm -hmm. So nice. That's lovely, you, you know. Uh, I, I think this is, this is what we find out, is that everything has a meaning. And it, because we're so earthly-centered, it's a great tragedy when we have a handicap. Think of somebody like Helen Keller, who had no ability, she couldn't hear, she couldn't see, and somehow she became such a potent intellect. It's, it's, but then we move on to the next world, and then we're free of the di disabilities. Then we need to, we, then we have spiritual disabilities, because we haven't developed certain spiritual capacities. And this is why it's so important to practice the daily practices Baha'u'llah says of obligatory prayer and annual fasting. The fast is coming up now in, in, in March. And it, it's, it's, it's such a bounty. I've seen a, a tablet. I was mentioning this last night to the youth. Tell what a tablet is. A tablet was one of the revealed writings of Baha'u'llah or Abdul Baha. It's called tablets. I suppose in the reflection of the tablets of Moses that he had. Oh, these aren't stone, they're paper, but they're there and they're sealed. So, um, the tablet, what was I looking for the tablet now? The tablet? In regards to fasting. In regards to fasting, yes. He said it's like a spider web. And you say fasting was like a spider web? That's very strange. Let's start to think about it a little bit. A spider has capacity to nourish himself hmm, in a very limited way without a web. But he spreads out this huge web and then he catches all kinds of morsels. That web is the fast. That catches spiritual bounties and that we can't obtain in, an, in another way. And it's only during that time that, that these, they're very special days. He says every hour of these days is endowed with a special potency and grace. And uh, it's, a, okay, that's an act of faith as you move, you move in that direction. But what a wonderful thing it is. Now, the Baha'i fast is abstaining from food and drink from sunrise to sunset. But if you get sick, it's part of the command of the fast that you don't, see, that you stop fasting until you're well again and then you start fasting again during those 19 days after you're 15 years old, and up to the time that you're 70. Thank you. <laughs> uh, please, a couple of hands back there. Okay, first. Okay. Um, according to my understanding from Baha'i writings, uh, our future of the, uh, the world is very bright and glorious. But when it comes about immediate future, it's very dark. And Bahala mentioned that this situation is going to get worse and worse. Yes. Till happens something that shakes mankind. Yes. Uh, what is your, uh, what do you think about that? And do you think that this is going to be, is that metaphorical? It can be physically happen something that, what is your, uh, thing? Well, I can only base you on, on the things that I read in the writings. It seems to me it, it's, uh, it has great spiritual implications, but it's physical. It's something physical. It says that when it comes, all eyes will stare up with terror. And he says, so dark is the future that I dare not tell you how dark it is. It would be unseemly to reveal to you what's going to happen to mankind. Uh, you, you know, we don't get it. We just don't get it. He sends two divine beings here to straighten us out. And we ignore them, or disobey them, or discount them. How long can we do that? What's, what's going on with the world that, that it thinks through politics it can establish a divine order that will be healthy and well for everybody? I mean, this is a really... If they don't know about the manifestation well enough, but if they've heard of it and rejected it, they're not in a very promising position. And having lent a deaf ear. There's a lot of people. I mean, Abdul Baha traveled across this country and it's estimated 90,000 people saw him and heard him speak. What was the response? 
they, a lot of them, as maybe we are in meetings like this, say, oh, that was so beautiful. And they walk out the door and they say, where is their, where is their good ice cream? Mm -hmm. And it's gone, you know, it's just, it, it, it didn't stick to them. And that, Abdu Baha returned to the Holy Land, he had warned them that if they didn't follow what he was saying, that the world would fall into a great war. And that the materialism was the material progress of the world had turned into materialism. And it was poisoning the water, it was poisoning everything, that our way of seeing life and understanding. Shoghi Finney said, materialism was born in Europe, raised in America, and exported to the whole world. Uh, this is what we see now in the world. Mm -hmm. So anyone that acts against any of the divine principles and teachings that we see recorded in scriptures produces a reaction. There's something happens. There's institutions that attacked Baha'u'llah or that attacked royalty just tumbled down. Baha'u'llah addressed the kings and rulers, the Bab addressed kings and rulers. And that we've seen since then the downfall, what, about 60 monarchies in the world just disappeared. Why, well, you know, okay, we see it was the circumstances, the politics, or the this or that, but no, there's something in this quite interesting to observe. There's a book written by Shoghi Effendi analyzing the, the first take of anal analysis on all the sufferings in the world called The Promised Day Has Come. And also, the, it ends on a very high note because it defines what you're talking about, the glorious future of the human race. Abdul Baha used to say that the, the future of the human race is very bright, very glorious. Shoghi Effendi said that his meaning is that the immediate future is dark. And we see the state of the world now. We, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's such a privilege to be born into this age. Yes. To, be, to I mean, he takes the most puny of us, and we transform and we transform, and, and here we are. How lucky can we be to be in this age, no matter what the end is? You know, really, 250 years ago, we would have missed it entirely. We would have had no possibility of responding to this message. Just the, the opportunity to respond to this message and because it's not propagated all over the world, to be able to pass it to another individual, even one other individual that you, that you set on fire or can pass the flame of your own faith to in this new day for this new messenger of God, he said is surrounded by terrific rewards. The reward of a martyr, Baha'u'llah says in one, in one of his writings, to if you quicken one, one other soul, because that soul then will quicken other souls. It just, it, it goes on and on, you know, and it's not brightness, it's brightness of spirit, but not brightness of necessarily mental capacities. One, one more. One more. I think we had one more person back there that had already oh, raised their hand. Maybe we can have two okay. more. Uh, okay. Was his hand up first? Yeah. Since he's a youth, he gets to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going through the movie process and I'm currently on book six. And you speak up. Nice and low. Uh, currently on the book six of the Rudy process. We Very good. Talking about the concept of teaching. Uh huh. And I was wondering about your outlook on teaching the day. <laughs> New talk. <laughs> but simply what I was trying to say is that it, we're commanded to proclaim the faith, to make people understand in the first instance that there is such a thing as the Baha'i faith founded by Baha'u'llah, who we believe came from God, and who has given answers to the world's problems that we're facing right now. If you can get that message out, it's not so difficult for any of us to do. Now the person then can respond. I try to do it in a gentle, loving way, as if you're offering jewels to a king. This is what Abdu Ba'a says, the, the nature of teaching. We should be, we're not proselytizing. We don't want to bludgeon people into believing it. What's the point of that? We want people that are more enthusiastic about it after we tell them than we are. That would be ideal, you know, really, if we could. And, and it, oftentimes it happens that way. Well, you've made enthusiasts. I'm going to permit this last question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Judge Nelson. Yeah, you you know, stand up. Oh, too, too, too. I, well, I can't. All right. Yeah. I can. I can. I can hear you. Yeah. 
Okay, first of all, I just want to thank Judge Nelson, the obedience to Shogi Fendi to have a fireside once every 19 days in one soul. This is a sample of firesides. My question then to the Honorable Hoopa Dunbar is, why was America chosen to be in the primacy stage to lead the world? Ah. Why were they chosen to, to be the inheritors of the divine plan? Yes. It starts way back on the first night that the Bob spoke to Mullah Hussein. He addresses himself to the peoples of the West. He says, arise and champion the cause of God. And that became then incorporated in Abdu'l-Bah's time in the tablets of the divine plan. In the advent of divine justice, as you're probably aware, mm -hmm. Shoghi Effendi <coughs> outlines the reasons why did the faith appear in Persia? Most backward, corrupt, venal, cruel society in the world. It's the Holy Land. We glorify it. We say it'll be the future center of the world in many ways, you know. But because of that. Then he turns to America and he says, and for the similar reasons, America was chosen to arise and go out the Baha'is in America were called upon by Abdul Baha to go out to all the islands and countries of the world. And why is that? Because they wouldn't go because of material interests, because it's better living here. <laughs> but they had to arise and sacrifice materially in order to go. And, th and they had qualities that could be awakened, but they were corrupt politically and corrupt as a country from a materialistic point of view. Uh, well, that's a that wonderful question. Yeah, I'm glad we got it in. <laughs> I'll say to be continued. This is a historic night. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're all here. <laughs> the thing that brings me joy is that Mr. Dunbar lives in Northern California. Yay. Oh. It's not, he's not in Israel anymore. He's not back east. He has <laughs> wonderful friends that help him live while he's here. Um, but what we show him now our absolute gratitude. Mm -hmm. You have infused the spirit. You have lit the fire yes. in the heart of a lot of us in this room. So join me in thanking him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.